Welcome to Renolda Church. We are one church meeting in multiple locations throughout the triad, and we are so glad that you're here today. Please take just a moment to fill out the Connect card you received when you arrived. Let us know you're here and let us know how we can pray for you this week. The Connect card is a great way to help us stay in touch across all of our campuses. At Renolda, we believe simple acts of selfless love can open hearts to Jesus, and together we can make a difference. Serve Saturday is coming up on November 19th, and there are amazing opportunities to bless others and to be blessed as we reach into our communities to show the love of Christ through real and tangible ways. We need your help. Every year, Renolda Church impacts its communities in powerful ways through many different cleanup and compassion projects. We have projects to serve single parents, widows, the elderly, refugees, those experiencing homelessness, and so much more. We also serve through many of our nonprofit partners to help in food pantries, clothing donation centers, pregnancy help centers, and so much more. Use the link below to sign up now. Get ready for an all church gathering on October 26th. Join us at the Village Campus for one united night of inspiring worship and transformational ministry. We welcome special guests Carl and Christy Greer from Texas to share their rich gifts of prophetic encouragement. Carl and Christy, longtime friends of Pastor Alan and Ann, are seasoned lay ministers gifted in hearing the voice of God. Again, we welcome you to Renolda Church. Let's worship together. God of waters, God of the sky, God in the morning, God in the night, God of the desert, God of the rain, God in the busy, God in the mundane, God of the mountain, God of the plains, God in the laughter, God in the pain. He's God of the promise. What he says remains true. He does what he's promised for me and for you. I want to start by saying welcome to everybody that's joining us online. Uh, we're so glad to be with you, and thanks for checking out Ronaldo Church, perhaps for the first time. Are you ready for some good news? Yes. God's got big plans. Oh, he, he is at work with thoughts, plans towards you, towards your future, towards our future that are better than we could imagine. We're talking about providence, and for uh, this message, I want to really zero us in on this idea of God having a plan. It's a big part of what providence means. And this is a beautiful text in the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 29, Start with verses four through seven. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And then picking up at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I'll hear you. And you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring you back from the place which I sent you into exile. I know the plans that I have for you to give you a future and a hope. I know the plans that I have for you. 
In the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie of the sequels, uh, the eccentric and uh, elusive pirate Jack Sparrow is uh, once again making a, a remarkable, silly escape. He's uh, escaping from Lord Beckett's ship to the attacking adjacent ship um, that is uh, being commanded by Barbosa, the Black Pearl. And Sparrow, somehow he shoots a cannon. He's got a rope tied to something, the cannonball shoots, and he's tied to the rope and it flings him up in the air 100 feet and catapults him over to the other ship. And uh, as Lord Beckett is watching the escape and gives a command to his officer that's standing there next to him, uh, he says to pursue the Black Pearl. And as he's saying that, the main mast on that ship falls over broken. And it's a comical scene. And his officer just says of Sparrow, he says, do you think he plans it all out or just makes it up as he goes? And it becomes one of the famous lines in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies because it sort of symbolizes the whole question of the, of the movie. Is Jack Sparrow the best pirate ever, who is just a sheer genius, who always has a plan and he escapes and he gets everything he wants? Or is it just sort of luck and he just sort of makes it up as he goes? And you're kind of wondering throughout the whole, the whole series. The tension of what makes the movie work really is wrapped up in that. I think most Christians don't have that hard of a time believing that God can be with you in difficult times and he can be with you in the good times and that God is in charge of the world. But it's an altogether, altogether different thing to think he really has a plan. He really has a thoughtful plan that's at work and it's impacting everything in my life. I don't know if we think like that all the time. And, th and that's why I'm drawn to this beautiful prophecy from Jeremiah that uh, I've been in a number of times uh, over the years because I love this, that I know the plans that I have for future and a hope. I want to think about what it means that God has a plan. God got big plans. And if this prophetic word can find a place down deep inside of your heart, it changes everything. It not only gives you a beautiful peace to um, be comforted in the challenging times, but it builds a sense of expectancy and energy in your life to be invested in, in life because God's got a plan. Um, well, okay, um, this is set in the time that we call the exile. Um, it's the time uh, after the Babylonian empire has invaded and they have destroyed the temple and by the plan of Nebuchadnezzar, they would uh, take their the, the enemies they've captured and exile many of them. If you look at it on a map, you just see that they have to, um, we got the map here, and you'll just see that they can travel north and then um, kind of back a little bit south and then further east into Babylon. It's a long journey. They're, in other words, a long way from home. And Babylon was set on the Euphrates River. It was a beautiful place. Here's an artist's rendering of um, some of what you might have seen there in uh, Babylon, um, if you can go to the next slide. And it, it just, it, it was, it was a, it was the largest city in the world at that time, um, and it was, it was a place of big society, but it was a pagan place. It was uh, a place of their captivity, and for the Jewish people, it meant they're not only away from everything that they held dear, their homes, their businesses, um, other extended family, but it means they're away from their temple. They're away from they're away from their faith community. They're, they're away from everything that is important to them. And so you could think of exile like that. You're not where you're ultimately supposed to be. That's what I think of exile. It's a, they're not going to stay there forever. 
and that's what this prophetic word's about, but it is also to say that um, you are here for this season. So if you think of exile biblically kind of as a symbol, it's an in-between place where you know this is not your dream, this is not where you ultimately want to be, and it's not where you're destined to stay, but it it is where you are. And I don't know, sometimes this can just be a, a life problem or a life disappointment that you never imagined that you would have, and you go, I can't believe I'm here. Or it could be a relationship. It could be uh, a marriage that you never thought, I never thought that could have so many problems. I never, ever would have imagined that I could be in this situation. And it, it could be um, it could be a season of obscurity. Um, I think of people like David, who was anointed to be king, but then he spent years hiding in caves of Adullam. Like, this isn't where I'm ultimately going to be, but I'm going to be on a throne, David's like, but right now, this is reality. This is where I am. It might be that um, you don't have the people around you that you once had. That's a, that's a feeling. It's been that sort of year for me. Um, my mom's death, my father-in-law's death, and um, changes. And all of a sudden, you look around, and you're just like, I didn't expect this feels so different. Exile, an in-between place. It's not where you're ultimately going to be. It's not where you're ultimately destined to be, but you are there. That's what the Babylonian exile was like. It was um, severe grief for them. When you're in exile, when, when they're in Babylon, or we're in these more symbolic type exile periods of our lives, um, I think they're they're equal and opposite temptations. One is a form of denial that says this is temporary, is so temporary that um, all I'm going to do is just endure it for a little bit and then I'll get back to normal. In fact, there were false prophets in Jeremiah's day that were essentially prophesying that. There, uh, We won't turn to it, but there was a, a specific prophecy that was saying this is only going to last two years. You know. And uh, the fact of the matter is, no, it was going to be uh, decades that they'd be there. There's a, there's a peril of saying um, this is going to just be uh, brief and this is not, you know, something I need to, I'm just going to endure it and then I'll, and then I'll get, because the peril is postponing life. Don't you feel like that was part of it? I mean, we didn't know what to do during pandemic, but that was part of the temptation all the time is just like, just I'm both postponing everything. And at first, it's like we just had to do that. People started postponing their weddings, postponing everything. And then at some point you go, I can't just, I don't know how long this is going to go on. I can't postpone everything forever. It is a, a temptation in, in exile to... Um, not give up on living, but just put it off. But the other temptation is to think that exile's forever. And if you feel like it's forever, then you despair of the future that you feel like God promised you. This is where you lose your hope that things will ever be different. And you start accommodating and acting like Babylon is your home, ultimately. Like, I'm never going to get out of this exile. So you just start accommodating to it. You just start identifying with it. And you can lose your identity and you can lose your sense of, of purpose. You can lose your sense of a future legacy. You can lose all of that. So, so in exile, you might be tempted to think, oh, just postpone living. Or you might be thinking, uh, this is going to be forever, so I give up. And the prophecy of Jeremiah comes in to say, don't do either of those. And so what... what what Jeremiah prophesies, the word of the Lord said, when you're in these cities in Babylon and you are in exile, and it's not a very short time, it's going to be decades that you're going to be there. So when you're there, don't postpone living. Build your houses, let your sons and daughters get married, have your children and your grandchildren. Don't, don't wait and say, and when we get back to Jerusalem one day, we'll start living again. Go ahead and prosper now. And he says, and while you're there, bless the city you're in. Even though it's pagan, even though you disagree with them, bless them. But do not become like them. 
do not become enmeshed with this culture. That's, that's the message. So there's something that God wants when we are in a place or a time that's very clear here that he wants us to be so identified with him and so certain of a future hope that we can be a blessing and bloom where we're planted. That's what we mean when we talk about being for our cities. So we serve in four different cities. We serve in, in uh, part of our, our congregation is in Kernsville, North Carolina, some in Winston-Salem, some in Clemens, some in King, four different places. And what we want to be known by is what we're for. God is for us and we're for our cities. We're for people. And so we're going to have a big day of serving all together in November for our cities. This is the very thing that, that Jeremiah is prophesying here. Be for your city. Even if you're frustrated with something in your culture, be, be for the welfare of the place where God has put you. No matter where it is and no matter how much you long to not be there because you want to be back to where you're supposed to be or reach your destiny, just, just be, be for the welfare of it. And I think that the, that the word of the Lord that follows is for the encouragement, the strengthening of the people so that you can be for your city. That's what the word that comes. The way that you can be energized, the way that you can be at peace, the way that you can be a blessing, even when you're not agreeing with the culture, like Babylon was a pagan culture, uh, false gods, even when you're, here's, here's how it's possible is you need to know the heart of God. I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope. Love, when joined together with wisdom and strength and resources, always wants to make a good plan for the blessing of the one who is loved. That's just the way it is. So uh, if you have not heard um, the world changed on Saturday night while I was at a Wake Forest football game and uh, we had a granddaughter that was born and um, Mia Joy Wright and She's, uh, she's, she's cute. Uh, so I got, I, I raced down to Charlotte after preaching on Sunday. She was born Saturday night to go down to the hospital and hold my granddaughter. And, um, let me just say, uh, something, you know, I, I, I just, a lot of dads I've known over the years, they, they all, they, of course they love their babies, but then they, they look so forward to when they're toddlers and their kids and then you can play with them and all. And every stage of parenthood is fun. It, raising kids is the most fun thing I ever did in my life. I just, it's just, it's just the most fun thing I ever did. And, um, but I'm one of those, I'm one of those guys that just, I've always loved holding babies. So to hold a grandbaby and the thing I, the, here's the thing I love about holding a baby. Somebody said, why do you like holding a baby so much? I thought, I'll, I'll tell you why it is. I like to pray for him. I, you get a baby in your arms and you pray for a one day old baby. And here's what I believe. I believe everything I'm praying and all the blessing I speak is going right in. I think it's just going right in. I spend my life praying for people and blessing people, but there's always some impediment, you know, because on the path to adulthood, we worked up a whole lot of doubts in God and we got a whole lot of shame and a whole lot of things. So there's always some impediment. Whenever you pray for somebody, you know, they're trying to receive, but there's some impediment, but not a little baby. Baby doesn't even, doesn't even, she doesn't even know she's being prayed for, but her spirit does it. I'm just blessing her. I'm just, I just love to hold. And uh, so I, I held her for a long time and I'm blessing her and I'm praying. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a grandfather and I'm holding a baby. What does my heart feel? Uh, I'm already making plans. I got, I mean, I got big plans. Somebody said, have you already bought her golf clubs? I said, no, but I know which ones I'm going to get. And, uh, and so then there was this moment where after I've held her and I've got to come back uh, and uh, help lead something Sunday night. So I'm going to have to leave the hospital. And uh, Ann's there too, but I'm going to hand him back. I'm going to hand her back to Bennett. 
And y'all, that's just, that's just, that's just weird. When you just hand your baby back to the baby that you remember holding. And I got so choked up, you know, like I'm just, and then I'm, he's choked up as I'm handing her back to, to Bennett. And, um, and we're both fighting back to tears and he's just like, I've been blubbering. I was like, well, I blubber too. And I handed it back to him and all I could muster was just to hand the baby to Bennett and say, now, you know, and what I meant by that was you can begin to understand something of the nature of the love that I have for you, son, because until you have that vulnerable place inside of you awakened that everything in your being um, cares for the well-being of that that child it's really too hard to describe loves like that and what Jeremiah is prophesying is the heart of God to people who are hurting what God wants you to know is that he's a father who if earthly fathers have sentiment of wanting there to be good plans for their children how much more God I think God loves you know sometimes we say you love so much it hurts I think God loves like that I think God has um, those kinds of intentionalities in his heart that are just overflowing towards us all the time. So he wants a word to go to his people who are in exile. They're away from their homeland. It is a season of discipline that is going to awaken their love for God. And I want you to notice what he says uh, back at verse 10. Thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon. And it's really interesting because the number of years that they spend in exile, it's roughly 70, but it's it depends on how you count it. I mean, uh, they're exiled. They start being deported in 586. Cyrus of Persia comes back through in 536. So there's really 50 years there. But some would say, well, you need to start this earlier. And it could be that 70 also carries that incredible symbolic weight to it that if you were with us when we studied Revelation and we saw how the number 70 is so symbolic because the number 7 is highly symbolic and the number 10. And both 7 and 10 have the sense of completeness or fullness or perfection. There's 7 days in a week, so it's a whole week if you have 7. It's, it's, it's like the finish of something, the fullness of it. And 10 is more like it's all there. There are 10 fingers, there are 10 toes, you know. And so seven times 10 also is a picture of like at the, at the fullness of time. And I want you to note that the 70 years here do not reference directly how long they, the people, are being disciplined or how long they're exiled. But notice this, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll visit you. The, the attention that God gives here is to remind them that he's sovereign over the enemy. And there's going to be a limit to the duration of the wicked empire's enslavement of you. There's a limit to the span of evil. But God's grace doesn't run out. I love that. It's um, to say that evil empires do not last and God's kingdom will last forever. So God is not here in the exile putting his children into some sort of terrible time out where he's saying, I'm just so tired of you. Just go to your room. I don't even want to see you. He is instead saying that um, there is a season of exile 
And you're going to learn things through this that you do need to learn. And it's going to awaken a thirst for me during this time. But what you need to understand is that I have an eye on it all. And I already have the plan by which Babylon will fall and you'll be returned. So I'm putting a limit on this evil. I've allowed this to happen, but there's a big limit on it, you see. And at verse 10, notice this. He says, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and implied, I will bring you back to this place. I will, I will, I will. I, I love that there is no mention here of the mandated repentance or even obedience of the people as much as God wants their repentance and their obedience. And as important as that is, he is not saying, until you prove that you have repented, until you convince me that you're worthy of my affection again, until such time, you're not coming back to your homeland, so you better shape up. That's, that's not the message. The message is there's a season of exile. There's a limit to the wickedness, and I'm in charge of that. And I am going to come, and I'm going to fulfill my promise, and I'm going to restore you, and I'm going to do it. It's not a it's not a it's not a father who's saying I'm sick of you go to your room and when you've become better then you can come back out that's not what it is. In verse 11 um, I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. It really reads in the Hebrew like I myself I alone, I know the plans that I have for you. To know in Hebrew, yada, it is a very intimate. It is like I am intimately aware of all of the plans that I have. And the word for plans here is basically hard to translate because it means something like thoughts, but it's not just thoughts. It means, according to the theological word book of the Old Testament, the basic idea of the employment of the mind in thinking activity. Not so much, I'm quoting the word book of, uh, uh, of Old Testament, not so much as to under, understanding, but to the creating of new ideas. That's what, is, that's what, this, that's what plans means. It means creative, imaginative thoughts that are, God says are going on in my mind towards you. And, and nobody knows my thoughts but me, God says, and, and I know my thoughts. And what he's saying here is that it's really important that you know <laughs> that though you don't know my plans, that I do know what I'm thinking and what I'm going to do. And it's creative. It is imaginative. It is beyond your understanding. It is magnificent. It is, um, it is a word in Hebrew that is used of the head builder of the tabernacle in devising his artistic productions. It's the same word. It is the word that is used to speak of what we call God imputing righteousness to Abraham. It literally is the same word, thoughts. It means God's thinking of Abraham as righteous, and so therefore he is. What's so wonderful about God's imagination is it's not like our imagination. where We might dream up something that could be and then we can begin moving towards it and maybe have even strong faith that it will be. But with God, it's more like his thought is, I think it'd be a good thing that there'd be light. So let there be light. His thoughts don't ever get separated from what he is going to do and say. I know my thoughts towards you. I know the plans that I have. It's not, it's not, it's not empty imagination. And so when God is saying this, he not only knows 
how he's going to raise up Cyrus of Persia to dethrone Babylon and restore the people. God knows it all to this very moment, to what he sees in your life and in my life. He knows the plans that he has for us. And that plan included a restoration that was only prefigured here because it is the gift of Jesus who is the object of God's perfect plan to come as a man to be human and take sin from us and take it into his being and let there be a transfer where then God thinks of us as if we are the righteousness of Jesus. And thus it means to be saved and to be a child of God. So all of this, when he says, I know the plans I have for you, it's all in his thoughts. I think it's important to think about the providence of God and to think often and think deeply about the plan of God for your life because of several reasons. When, when, firstly, when you believe there's a good plan, you can have peace. You have peace. I got to go out to a couple days of a theological roundtable in Texas this week. I'll get on a plane and um, I... I I don't get worried on planes. I, I, do, I, get, I either get good sleep or good work done on the plane. Um, even if it's bouncing around or whatever, it's, just, it's just a real safe way to travel. I, don't, I just don't mind me. And what the fact of the matter is, is that the pilot has filed a flight plan. And the flight plan is approved by air traffic control. The plan on a, on a, and I've got some friends that are private pilots and I've watched them file their flight plans. It, it includes considering weather and any potential storms and which way you need to go and other traffic in the air and um, any protected airspace and on and on. All of this goes into this elaborate plan. Here's, here's where it's going to go. Here's where it's going to go. It's going to go. It's going to fly this way. And so you just get on a plane and you just sit there and you go, somebody's made a plan. We're not just flying haphazardly here. I'm just going to trust the plan. There's a plan. And, and, and you can have peace. When you, when you have a sense that there's a good plan that's at work, then you have the capacity to endure challenges along the way, right? Like you're working out the plan. So God bless him, Matt Rule, Carolina Panther coach, got fired this week. And um, Panthers, poor Panthers, they're not winning. They're just not winning. And quarterbacks keep throwing interceptions. And uh, I, But I still hated it that Matt Rule got fired. I knew he was going to. But uh, because he's a preacher's son. And you ought not ever fire the son of the preacher. That's for one first rule right there. And the second is that he was a coach at my son's alma mater, Baylor University. And Matt Rule was so highly touted and uh, paid a fortune to come be the Carolina Panthers coach because he had a reputation for being a coach that could turn a program around. That's what he did when he was the head coach at Temple. And um, when he was at Temple, his first season, the team went 2-10, and ten, only won two games. And then they won 10 games in... Uh, the third year is there and the fourth year is there. And then Baylor, he went to Baylor, which had had a disaster of uh, a scandal. He went in the first year, players had left everything. And they only won one game. They went one and 11. And two years later, just two years later, he turned the whole program around and Baylor was 11 and one, won the big uh, 12 championship or played in the big 12 championship and went to the Sugar Bowl. And so the Carolina Panthers got him. And Matt Rule always had this saying that he would, it was his motto. While these teams were losing so many games and he was in the process of turning around, he said, trust the process. He kept saying to his players, just trust the process. He would tell, he would tell in press conferences, you just need to trust the process. And um, the problem about trusting the process is that if you're not winning yet, <laughs> and the first year he was at Baylor, uh, they were down 51 to seven at West Virginia late in the third quarter. 
and a linebacker, Jordan Williams, was said, he, came, he later said he was questioning the process. Came off the field and said he didn't even want to play anymore. And yet, uh, Rule turned around the two programs, and they thought he'd do the same thing at the Panthers. It hadn't happened here in, I guess, his third season, and uh, nobody was going to trust the process anymore. The challenge is really right there with God. Does God have a plan, a process at work, and can we trust it? That even though I'm still in Babylon and it doesn't feel like I'm winning yet, that there's a plan at work. That's what belief in providence means. It, it also is, if you believe God's got a plan, it also it, it just brings expectancy into your life now. And uh, some of you are planners, and maybe some, like me, would prefer not to have a plan. My wife is the ultimate planner. And so every vacation, she wants to have a plan. And I'm like, darling, every day in my life, I live on a calendar just telling me what I got to do every minute. A vacation to me is no plan. She's like, if we don't have a plan, then we won't even get into the restaurant and, and the things that you want to do, you know. And so we always have this conversation. But in 2010, we had a delicious sabbatical in which we took a trip across the country. And we got into a conversion van and we drove uh, all the way to California and looped around through some different states coming back. We might have gone to 20 or 30 states and... My wife, the planner, I mean, it was special. She had spent so many months planning it. Uh, our daughter was 11, her son was 15. And she had prepared, for example, an envelope, a big kind of package for each child, for each state that we would be going into. And when we would cross the state line, they got to open up their big envelope. And it had, of course, we were homeschooled, so we all had some educational in there about the state and learn about what the state bird is or the state that's on. But it also had some kind of game that might be related to that state, you know, and um, it might be related to some fun thing that we're going to do there. And then it had all these different treasures in it. So every time we'd be like, they were all excited, like, we're getting ready to cross over into Oklahoma and pull out the envelope. You know? And we... We had, she had made plans for us down to things like we wanted to travel for a while on Route 66, the old Route 66. And at the time was really popular, the animated film, the Cars movies were out, which was set at Route 66. And so the van had a big TV in it. And so she had all planned, like we're gonna be getting on Route 66. So she had them watching Cars. And, you know, so she's got all this plan and we were stopping at a place called the Midpoint Cafe, which was midway between Chicago and Los Angeles, I guess, wherever Route 66 went. It was the Midpoint. And there was a cafe back from the old days, of Route 66, Midpoint Cafe. So she'd all plan, we're going to eat at Midpoint Cafe for lunch. And you watch cars on the drive over there. We got out at Midpoint Cafe. And this part, uh, you can't make this up and you can't plan for this. Only God could. We didn't realize we got the Midpoint Cafe. It was the inspiration spot for the movie Cars. And some of the uh, uh, ladies that work there were the inspiration for some of the characters in Cars. And in fact, they had taken that whole staff from the Midpoint Cafe, just a, just a little diner out in the middle of nowhere at the big uh premiere of cars they flew them out to charlotte and um and had a big part of it and we got to meet the basically the people the inspiration of the characters and uh, you know every step of the way was like this and so what happened with the kids was they realized oh man there's things that have been planned and we don't know what it is but it's going to be good the next plan that comes along so what i'm saying is if you think about God's providence that brings about a plan for your life, it, it enables you to be comforted when you're in Babylon. There's a plan. 
It enables you to endure the challenges, trust a process, a plan that's at work, but it also builds this sense of expectancy. If God's got a plan, then you can wake up in the morning and think, what part of the plan, the good plan, is going to get unveiled today? He wants us to live like that, even during the exile times of our lives. And when you start living with all of this, I think that's the thing that fuels us being a blessing to our city for the, for the welfare, the shalom, the well-being of your, of your own community, of wherever you are. God never asks us out of a depleted self with no real energy or any deep sense of blessedness to go and just blindly and obediently try to do good. Instead, it's, it is always, here's who you are and here's how I've blessed your life and this is why, therefore, you can be a blessing everywhere you go. So seek the welfare of your city. Be for your city. Be, be for others, even those that are against you. You can do that when you know God's got a plan for your life. So God's like a father, like reminding me, I'm just like holding a, holding a grandbaby. What is happening here? And you begin to think and dream. And real, real sense, I'm a grandfather. I'm holding, I know my thoughts towards her and she doesn't. And I'm human, but my thoughts are expansive towards her. And she's a baby and she can't understand it. The gulf between God's wisdom and ours is infinite. And he's holding us, even in exile. And he's saying, I know the thoughts I have for you. And it's for your good, not for your harm. It's for a future and a hope. That's providence. That's the gospel. Well, I feel a warm wind blowing Melting all the sadness off of my soul And I smell the sweet cherry blossoms Putting all the gladness into my It's
I mean, there's a place in, in life that's something that's really important in the spiritual life and in the practice of spiritual discipline, uh, the practice of gratitude for what God has done. And that, that's the part of our life that we are called to, like in this song, look back and see how God had a plan. And it's really important that you see God's providence, how it has unfolded. Oh, I see how God's plan, I see how that worked out for good. I see how God, that God was involved in that and, and, you, and you, you connect the dots. That's really important. But what Jeremiah 29 is about is when you're in exile and you have yet to see how it's all going to work out. And you don't know that Cyrus of Persia is coming. And you don't know what it's going to be like to have a temple rebuilt. You don't know what, you, you don't know how it's going to work it out. And he's saying, what I want you to know is just this. You're my child. I'm holding you. And I know the thoughts that I have. And they are good. It's a future and it's a hope. So in a very real sense, when you worship God and you think on his goodness, what you're thinking about is how he's thinking of you and how he's thinking of a beautiful plan. And when you think much of that, that's what it is to cherish providence. May the Lord God bless you keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace tonight and forevermore. Amen and amen.